I would like to share the screen so everyone can actually see the poll. You should be oh, able to see. share now. Yes. Um, let's see. Um, okay, I see Mark is sharing the link. Yep. And I will take just a second to share it myself and then we can start. Here's David. Oh, David is here? Yes. Okay, then we can either, um, let's see. I'm sorry, I had a hard time getting in there. Um, Christina, are you putting up your poem right now for yes, a reason? I, I just, I, I'll take it down. Do you, do you want me to take it down right now? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Put it up when you read, it's fine, but. Oh. David, you were, we, we're going to have you read first, but now we, then we decided that Christina will go first. So you're going to be reading second. Is that okay, David Blair? It's fine with me. I might run. I, okay. I had a hard time signing in for some reason. It was, I, you know, it took me. Uh, there was a moment when we were bombed. Maybe that's why. How you doing, Philip? Great. Hey, so, so lovely to see you guys. Okay, so I think I will go ahead and launch this reading. Um, uh, so there we are. John Hennessy didn't make it. So instead of 20 Massachusetts poets, we're 19 today. Uh, I will. Let me again put the list of the readers in order in the chat window so that everyone can see it. There, I just put it there. Um, Christina Cortez will be reading first. Um, Christina is a writer advocating for full social integration of people with disabilities and sovereignty of indigenous identity. Thank you for being us, for being with us, Christina. Please go ahead. Thank you, Philip, for that introduction. And the and the poem I will read is from my recent poetry collection that has been published. That one thing to you, poems at the time of the Inca, 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 a bilingual poetry edition, a bilingual poetry edition. So here, right, this here's. I will share the screen. Christine, I, I cannot, cannot hear you very distinctly. I wonder if there's anything we can do about it. Should we all mute our mics, the rest of us, while we... Yes, yes. I should mute go ahead. And Let's and mute our mics. Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. So I will be sharing a poem for my recent poetry collection. Um, the one to the poems of the time in Inca, Inca, a bilingual poetry, poetry edition. I will share the screen now. So, this poem is called You Will See, You Will Find. You will find my face. At a place whose name is lost to time. Now called Garagay, you will find a square pyramid and inside a fresco of a human face with fangs. That is me. At the beginning of my reign over the land, when I had no name, in an age when I had no name. Two, at a place whose name is lost to, to time, now called Cerro Sechin Alto, predecessor of the Shavin, you will find a human face, human head with fangs, carved. Out of the whole, carved, carved out of white granite, mounted onto the walls of this ancient city. That is me at the beginning of my reign over the land in an age when I had no name. Three, at a place who whose name is lost to time, 
he will now called Seros Achim, predecessor of the Shavim. You will find stone carved panels in base relief with prowling jaguars and men transforming into jaguars. That is me at, a, at the beginning of my reign in an age when I had no, when I had the name Fanged God. And four, at a place whose name is lost to time, now called Moche Valley, you will find painted palace walls with a human face that fangs. That is me at the beginning of my reign over the land in an age when I had the name I Ayatek. Five, at a place called the Cusco, Cusco, or Cusco Valley. My jaguar form will not be seen. I have set it Set, set it aside, set aside my skin to be the creator God who emerged from the foam of the sea. That is me at the beginning of my reign over the land when I had the name Contiki Viracocha or Viracocha. That's the, that's the conclusion of the poem. And that is a poem in five parts from the opening poem in five parts from my book, the one to two poems at the time of the Inca. The book can be, can be found on booksandsmith.com. And I hope you enjoyed the reading. Thank you so much, Christina. I appreciate it. Well, that's a great start. Uh, now, for some reason, I'm unable to minimize the screen. Is it because of the screen sharing? I will. I will just continue. Yes. Okay, so it's back back to normal now. Um, our second read reader today is David Blair, who lives in Somerville and teaches poetry at a few universities. His new books are. Barbarian Seasons, a collection of poetry, and Walk Around, a collection of essays, both from Madhead Press. He also has three previous collections of poetry. Welcome, David. Great to have you. Hey, thanks, Philip. Thanks for putting this together. And um, I'm going to plug another reading. Mark, who's a wonderful poet, is the publisher of Mad Hat, and I are going to be reading on Thursday night for Gloria Mindoc. And um, that's a Zoom reading too. And we're gonna to be reading with Donald Vincent and a, a new poet, young poet named Afia Kip. All right, since it's a Massachusetts reading, here's a Massachusetts poem. Uh, I'm sure everybody's thinking about the election a lot. I know I am. Odd facts of Cape Cod and judgment time. Their first political act, theft, Alan Dugan. Scrub pine forest where I hope we do not get ticks with 15,000 year old freshwater ponds, sand bottom and woods where your foot pokes through black crust soil to sand. Massachusetts weirdness, I love it. I am like that dog who stares all day into the dinghy bottom with no bottom because it is a television for fish or a water bowl, or a television for fish and a water bowl. Bonus, I don't even know one camper from another. Whack bivouac in a go to hell time. Go to hell time for everybody, especially around the lighthouse by the tennis club. Birdie's tough, Sabrina says. She can handle it and then Looks beat up now, but the house is well made. We don't know the Greek revival columns at night would be lemon and lime pops in the morning sun. 
one dude with dreadlocks and beard has been going here since his grandfather was born. Unhappy whiskey look around his eyes like a first Friday someplace socially awful. And the tennis blush and clothes hang a certain way on the bony butted frames of the blondes and graying men around whose sleep seals blow yap-sized bubbles that explode around their tabby print sportier patterns when seals are real for shark food. Flippers like hands and feet, but not legs on arms, but what the hell is birdie? Who the hell is birdie, Sabrina? I just made that up. You see what happens when we end up when we really watch, end up gaping at Brett Kavanaugh's wife and her struggle to keep lips from staying open, retrofitted social x-rays behind him in committee because the plastic surgeon gave one too many cranks to the gears of the machine, and then towns fill with fog and cell phones in fog and people in sweatshirts that say Chatham because they are on it. Throwbacks, the reality strays from appearance. Hyannis, for instance, actually gets located on ways and better apps in southeastern Ohio. The horns on the ferries piped in. Let's pretend we are near the beach and the social club seems, the tennis club seems run by the kids from Scooby-Doo. Even that scowling sky and with Rasta curls, looking at the social contract to say, stay thin man boys and bone ladies. I meet a guy on the morning beach. Great to be up here from Norfolk, where it is hot as hell down there now. Ah, okay, here's another one. The far side of election days. And I wrote this when, um, you know, I was worried that Elizabeth Warren would not get the nomination, right? And I was right. <laughs> the far side of election days for Gary Larson. When the great senator goes from state to state, she gets even more amazing the way Theodore Roosevelt was amazing, I say. Then this little asshole I could really imagine because I know him goes, uh, she kind of looks like Theodore Roosevelt there, pal with those glasses up on her nose and her hand in the air in a way he might have taken to himself in bull moose days long gone. I know, you can't believe these guys, these guys. You can't believe these guys. We are talking about places in Wisconsin and Illinois and Michigan and Ohio, big states delegate rich territory to apes it's like she comes to life right out of a cartoon that hangs above the cigarette machine in a roadhouse that has long vanished or which hangs on by some little gas station and two motels 15 miles away from some more populated place in new hampshire you have to pull you have to have <laughs> sorry you have to pull the knob and wiggle it if you want your parliaments to drop. Think of a lot of stars over a parking lot and no cars in the parking lot at all. There are all these hunters crushed with hunting hats and arms and rifles all akimbo. Some of them dressed as Daniel Boone and here is why. This giant chicken comes after them at the bar and so down she sat on them like they were her nest. Her little bald headed crying mouth squinting brood. This bar does not exist anymore. But look at the stretched hands over these keyboards, the cuffs on the hairy wrists. They work at keyboards. They have cuffs. They talk. They look dumb. All right, and the last poem I'm gonna read is uh, Lines for Pope Francis in Cuba. Marie, Pope Francis went to Cuba. 
That scene in The Leopard when the family goes to mass and sits up front alongside the altar in high back wood, but now this, that nun who is young for a Cuban nun in a brown habit like a cigar wrapper sings, that big band orchestra of cardinals and red beanies about to stand up and swing that music behind the Pope, that country, we keep a jail there, that damp closet, we like the sandwich, that country that is so close and so far away and is perhaps shaped a bit like kidneys or livers, that old scholar who seems beyond grading people and thinking he is some sort of big time standard, that space they made for the priests and nuns and wheelchairs, that sense of hot, of tropical hot and antique standing fans. And uh, thank you, Mark, for this beautiful book. And thank you, everybody. And thank you, Philip. David, a pleasure. Thank you. The third reader is Katya Kapovich. And she is a bilingual poet and one of Russia's leading poets and authors of short fiction. Her English poetry collections are Gogol in Rome and Cossacks and Bandits, both from Salt. Welcome, Katya. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Philip, for <laughs> letting me read. We're in, we're in different rooms. <laughs> <laughs> so we're honest when we're saying this. OK, um, just read the um, old poems from Cossacks and Bandits. Um, I also have good news. Uh, I have a, a book in Russian and selected poetry came out of the big publishing house, the kind of, can you hear me? Huh? Yes. Yes, we, yes can. we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, thanks, Gabe. Um, to catch a hedgehog, to catch a hedgehog, you need to wear your hedgehog gloves. His belly is smooth, vulnerable, covered with gray fur. Hold him there with both hands. Your mom will sigh and dad will frown when you return from woods grass in your hair, all over your brown, worn over coat, and your finger bleeds. Now you have a silent friend who drinks his milk from a puppy pan and trots at night across the wasteland of hardwood floors over and again. To bond with the hedgehog, you must become an owl who has sounds for colors. The winter apartment is warm and calm. Lights out, the game starts. A change of wind. On the eighth day, he coined the word alone and saw that it was as good as everything else. A yellow school bus rattled down the lane, a wind blew in a drain pipe strongly leafless. I brought two empty crates to the parking lot, watched neighbors with briefcases and car keys. At noon, a mailman pa passed by where I sat invisible like a tree among trees. Why, why, I asked. I wanted to know why, but only scared the squirrel that dropped his acorn when my voice broke silence unexpectedly, a white noise in a wireless telephone. My club soda went flat in the bottle. With a spit of rain, a wind blew again from the lake. I raised my index finger and touched it. Pleading, give me a break, give me a break. Hero. On a cold winter night in 78, he drank two liters of Russian tea, went to Red Square before light and wrote on snow, Brezhnev is an idiot. He was my God, my hero, my model world. 
I imagined him struggling with his fly when busted by police, he had managed to end the sentence with an exclamation mark. Imagine doing something like this nowadays. Imagine a hero dressed in a short skip, sheepskin coat, standing in the piercing wind, his pants pulled down, gross you'll say, and will be wrong. Sometimes truth necessitates madness and beauty is hidden behind obscure details. To tell you the truth, I'm still jealous of him who shed his urine in the imperial garden of snow and laughed in the face of the gods. Nothing beats in my eyes a jester, his smile full of broken teeth. But when time in the yard are full of lies, why sing like a nightingale in the emperor's cage? Flamenca evening. Because spring came a month late, whole crowds descended into the streets, including myself and that midget girl. A band was playing flamenca favorites and she was all dressed up as if for a date who had stood her up in front of all those people. She started tapping her foot, her shoes on unbearably high heels for the rhythm, but never left the spot between the neon of the Cambridge Trust Company and the dismantled meadows of Harvard flowers. Her short white hands pressed to her chest embraced her broken heart and held it like a bowl of milk. She danced and danced, her shadow growing longer than her body. In the square, streetlights came on, erasing footprints from the dust but leaving standard paper cups to whiten in the regular dusk. And the last one, locked out. Last night I thought of my abandoned love and wondered what had made us poles apart and more aloof than fingers in a glove. I asked myself, whether it was his life or death that opened a bracket, closed a bracket in the year 61 and 92. I turned to the naked wall and pulled my blanket up to my chin, which people always do when they can't find the answer to the question. In its tranquility and prickly warmth, this winter morning is a woolen mitten. I vividly recall a placid youth his elbow sharply angled on the table, an empty table in the empty kitchen. But soon he fled the compass of his cradle, his suitcase in the porch, on the porch, his mother in a chair. He held his cigarette with an indifferent air. An outcast port of the frosty Carillon Peninsula, he escaped its foil and fled to Europe to meditate on most and bit known things such as the charcoal of those West German skies in the white season where once his eyes adjusted to the white kilometers of crumpled Russian linen paled by comparison and he turned off the light. But here I am, another spy in from the cold, investigating angels from the wires seven Mondays a week, forever young, red haired, but somewhat rusty in the spinal cord, I sat to coffee cups on a plastic tray and shuffled to the balcony where the organ of icicles drip silent notes in the alley. Who, who would count on such a groggy Guten Morgen? Let's face the present, drawing a mental line. We both foretold those, this tingling in the branches, this droning in the crusted skeleton of ancient rail tracks, cross ties, wooden stitches, the red, blue, purple current of cars, of the cars, and shall I also mention honking feet on salt and sand, surviving all this whole farce only music persists. When the poet is finally left alone, when a lover abandons love, the kettle drums of winter clamor loudest for the one who delays joining company with the centaurs and snow monsters. Only music pours, 
Over my years, by way of dripping snow, I have locked myself out. I shake the door to shots of coffee and I'm set to go. Thank you, guys. That will be all. Thank you, Katya. And now we have Mark Vincenz, who is a poet, translator, novelist, editor, publisher, musician, and designer. His latest collection of poetry is Here Comes the Night Dust. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Philip. This is a new poem. It's called Cliffhanger. All hail the monster on this Hallow's Eve. Watch the pandonium unfurl. The damsel is in distress and the dull dawn rumbles. A shadow stands watch over your grave. Don't recoil from the long years of time. Wait until day mushrooms into itself. Know the way melds every little living shadow, fills itself within us until we find our material self in unison. At the top of the belfry, with the first rush of wings, within the roots of the sun, let the voices boil up, first simmer on a low heat, gas is best, that assured flame in purple robes. Don't sob, we're perennials, monster, and we know how to glow in the dark. Where do you lay your eggs? Do you leap from branch to branch or crawl like the ivy? All the lashes on your frame, a ladder among the clover. Be your full material self. Press your face to mine. Let me be a swallow to your hawk. You've named a tree for me? Cross the meadow and turn away from the stairs. Are you still lying and waiting? Don't fear the crowds in the street. Return to your roots, your humble abode where the hinges are rusty and voice barely audible. Recently, no wind arrived with your premonition, looking for you, shouting you out in the darkness. Me? I still sink. But you, from the moment you were born, encased in a shaft of light, not holy or risen, but brimming, overflowing, a gift. I dreamed in the high branches. And here another one called Half Truths. Read between the lines with your nefarious mind. Grammar isn't what it's cracked up to be. Look deep, stare, gawk. Don't hold your breath. There's something underlying all this. Stop, underscore, a road half traveled less than more. Use it to reach a pivotal performance. Get your paycheck. The fallacy of believing, therefore, to be better, to be generous-minded right here, where all experience performs, fishing for the real American dream. Oh, you so understand. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you, Philip. Stephen Sturgeon. His books of poems are Trees of the 20th Century and the Ship. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Philip. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I like looking at everybody. I've, I've missed a lot of you uh, recently. Scrolling through the names of the viewers, I even see Haida Hatchery. I remember a long time ago when she roasted a pig in Harvard Square. Boy, oh boy, those were the days. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's very nice to be here. Very happy to be here. It's been very sad to be away from people and they're, they're missing my friends, a lot of whom are on this uh, call. So it's very good to, to see a lot of you again. And uh, in that same spirit, I thought I'd read some poems that are dedicated uh, to my friends. So I'll read three poems. Um, and the first one is dedicated to Katya Kapovich. The Fountain. Remember the greasy park on the final warm day of that hot year? Pigeons that pouted toward the curbs with a bench woman feeling her torn teeth as if each were a sun banished from distances, paltry with age. 
What were you doing posing inside its drained fountain while the bus struck past the cabbage green fence bleeding at heaven and hell? Later, the rain stuck on our skins like candles gelatinous wax and wiping it from my arms with newspaper, closing my eyes, I could not see you in your spotted shorts stepping into that bowl, then sanely glancing at the traffic's maze, tying your hair back with an elastic, the way a climber will do before catching on to the mountain. And the next poem I'll read is dedicated to Philip Nikolaev. I don't know if, Philip, I don't know if you remember this one. I dedicated it to you a long time ago, but maybe you'll remember it. And I'm not sure I remember how to read it. Let's see. Okay, we're gonna see. I thought before sleeping next to running water, the derangement of day is the first act. Blighted as in the everlasting bed, then shagged with hook seed, shirtless in the grass. He hears the fiery pliers where he walks, rejects the rags of Rasputin, sensing form without edge, edge without an ending, ascending through a surfaceless ocean. Assuming all is wonderful and false, regardless of continent and season, continental leisure, seasonal shame, combing the sun's rotund perimeters, the globe furnishes clothes after enough or no endurance, purposes a kiln for our kith and flighty reemergence. Yes, there is destruction in the first act. For what else should he bathe and comb his beard? Debussy on Mercury, Plato close to Pluto, and he, his musicalia, impacting to the moon, the bellicose barca rolls, deliquest piano rolls, lives in the cold of the moon, his kingdom a cratered tesseract not visible from earth. A meadow near unseen through rows of trees is more than meadow and road trees. It is more there for nearly not being, less there than here. As if carved from the sun, his trekking tongue refutes the things he makes and explores by illuminating them. A sip of water. The third poem is has two dedications. I don't know if this is uh, if this is done. It's one of the people it's dedicated to is dead, and the other person is alive. So it's dedicated in memory of Landis Severson, uh, another friend that uh, I wish were around. It'd be nice to be able to see him, and it's also dedicated to Ben Mazer. The title of this poem is Dead on Top of Saturn. Everyone tried wanting you and where you are now, the exactly hexagonal 30,000 mile wide thunderstorm is green today. Yesterday it was yellow. What colorizes storms, acidifies the wind, washes the heart to enter Jerusalem, I don't know. Hearts are washed in wax, at other times bathed in snow, I think, and as your heart had washed a fierce hand well, these solvent tides help convert your will through another's lust, collapse indignities into clean ignorance, contrary jet streams, molten helium, electrical crescents roasted to beds with diamond trilling in the glassy latitudes where you are now and I don't know anything. From the hexagon. I remember the friends that I forgot as dark strange shapen flatland things, oil stains in a parking lot where one gushing street lamp light bulb hangs. You are at the North Pole of Saturn. Remarkably, I am not. I don't know. If I am at the North Pole of Saturn, I am with you. 
therefore I wonder if I am. At first the green wind put you ill at ease. That is the wind one sees, circumnavigating a foreign planet's equator, away from a fluent breakfast table. Do you want to travel at the speed of light? By the time this is over, Saturn will be singing. From the hexagon. The mud sang to me in Guatemala. Then, years before that, in Nevada, we'd be hot bunking, listening like they were psalms to the detonation of atomic bombs, curdling the desert to mirrors, rip by rip, that I could fall into, putting myself to sleep. If there is a way back, then I don't know where I am. Things Cassini would not image, the hearts bathed in molasses, other hearts washed in a smooth liquid neutrino densifier, beat to the time of the merry widow between the planet's rings, undetected also by the visible and infrared mapping spectrometer and the ultraviolet imaging spectrograph. I see that now, when your heart is a lagoon, loving a deformed soul who has saved your life from a similar deformation, maybe voluntary, is hardly a choice from the hexagon. But dear Jack, dear Ben, I can't remember you. Green car, red shoes, trashed pants. I remember the edge of balance, a cash allowance, considerate science. But dear Jack, dear Ben, I can't remember hearing you. And dear Jack, dear Ben, I can't remember you. Nonetheless, I love you as though I were dead and you were not. I don't know. Cassini's dead. Saturn has never not been. In a basement, on a card table, you can make love. Now extract the reverse pressurized gravitons from my mouth, and they'll see about putting in some hollyhocks. From the hexagon. When they tell you not to worry, show them this. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you, Stephen. And of course, I remembered the dedication. Thank you. I for thought you. That. I thought that's your so thanks. That's great. Um, and next we have Kevin Gallagher. His latest book is The Apprentice from Droga Drogada. Is that how you say it? By Red Fox Press Ireland. Madhead Press will publish In Yet It Moves later in this later this year. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks so much, Philip. Great to see everybody. I am going to read from this new book, uh, fresh out of the box, The Apprentice from Dragada. It uh, tells the story of a forgotten Boston poet, uh, John Boyle O'Reilly. There's actually two huge sculptures of him in Boston, uh, one right outside of the uh, MFA at the end of Hemingway Street, and another one uh, up Westland Ave on the edge of the Fens, right across from sort of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, the Apprentice of Dragada, 1865. The world is small when the enemy is loose. I'll rest when they have nooses around their necks. I know what I have been born to do here. I won't be a serf on our land they took. I won't just stand here as we starve to death. Our world is small and the enemy is loose. We are losing our faith, our lives, our food. The ugly truth is they may hang me first. But now I know what I'm here to do, to fight for freedom and independence too. I will kill undercover in a British vest. The world is shrinking and the enemy is loose. A silent voice won't do anyone good. Life is your chance to make your own events. I know what it is that I have here to do, even if it means that I'll meet my doom. At least I will die in the pursuit of truth. The world is shrinking and the enemy is loose. Now I know what I was born here to do. O'Reilly was born uh, in Ireland in the mid 19th century. He was a fierce Fenian. And as you might glimpse from that poem, he tried to infiltrate the 
uh, English army and uh, topple it from within. And guess what? It didn't quite work out. And he was thrown in just about every major British jail and escaped from every single one that he was put in. So they decided to ship him to Australia, where he escaped from that one too, and found himself on a Boston whaler, made himself to Boston, became a famous poet, became a famous abolitionist, and editor of the Boston Pilot, the second biggest newspaper of the time in the 19th century Boston. Escape. I slid from the drains and hid in the fog until my fellow prisoners were taken back up the hill. Then I ran for the coast. I heard the prison bells when the guards learned there was no one to return to my cell. I didn't eat, drink, or sleep at all. I was too scared to beg or stop. Briars and branches ripped my clothes off. I heard the dogs and ran for the river. I was white fright running through the night. I dipped in that river slowly without a ripple. I collapsed unconscious and you caught me. Well, I beat you for two days and two nights. Your biggest mistake was not hanging me. He escapes from that, finds his way, uh, uh, gets caught and gets shipped to Australia to become Prisoner 9843. My job was to hack the jungle to death. After years of cutting and blasting roads, not one single white man ever found an ounce, but the Australians would never give up. Black skinned bushmen moved all around us. Their chiefs wore hammered breastplates of pure gold. Riveted by 30 pounds of iron, separated from my compatriots, you gave me an ax and taught me how to swing. I looked at the army of mahogany lit up by thousands of white cockatees, motionless under a blue copper sky. My sweat would sting as my ax would ring and those giants of a lost age fell down. As I said, he escaped into the ocean, gets on a Boston whaler, absconder, to the attention of all British colonies, Times of London, 1869. John Boyle O'Reilly, registered number 9843, Imperial convict, arrived in the colony per convict ship Hougamont, 1868, sentenced to 20 years, 9th of July, 1866. Description, healthy, appearance, present age, 25 years, five feet, seven and a half inches, high black hair, brown eyes, dark complexion, and convicted Irishman. Dangerous, conniving, untrustworthy, against the crown, revolutionary, absconded from convict road party, Bunbury, 18th of February. The last poem I'll read. He makes it to Boston, somehow scrapes from being, showing, there, showing up there with, here with nothing and uh, uh, dying as, as one of Boston's elite and one of the most famous poets in, in the United States at the time uh, and the editor of one of the biggest newspapers in the United States at the time too. Uh, and this shows the full turnaround that he has in his life. His last poem is called, I Shall Be Counted In With The Black Men, Faneuil Hall, 7th of December, 1885. We don't have colored people's waiting rooms, but I know many hotels in Boston where they would say all their rooms are filled if any one of you asked for a room. You can't legislate conceit of the white people. This outrage is higher than any law. The black man is the only American who has written new songs and new music. The black man is the most spiritual, worshiping with his soul and not with his mind. The black man will bring great poets, great painters, and great fashioners of God's beautiful shapes in clay in marble and in harmony, I shall be counted in with the black men. Thanks so much, everyone. Jim Dunn, Philly's not gonna be able to beat the C's in the first round. Kevin, thank you. That's just fantastic. That was so interesting. Um, our next reader is Valerie Duff. Her second book of poems, Aquamarine, is forthcoming from Salmon Poetry in 
in 2021. Welcome, Valerie. Thanks. Thanks, Philip. I appreciate that being part of such a big gathering. It's, it's kind of different after being in isolation for so long. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from the new book, and I hope it will come out in 2021. We'll see. Um, Biome. There was a blue drink on the porch sill at the Black Whale, and it was summer. So many things show up on tests. This is how we live, adjusting odds, percentages in our favor. Still, I sweated in the hot back room with windows seemed shut, Googling survive, Googling fear, Googling possibility, the Wi-Fi ghosting, never death, never radial symmetry, or prime mover. Meanwhile, outside, bumper cars and sand toys. Big island rabbit on the back path, my long dead grandfather watching from the oyster grass. The island birds pieced their nothing nests in soft white sand and little tar, not far from Three Mile Island, against the tide, the guard who held me upside down for fun when I was five. How close lifeguard to diagnostic tool. I never felt the thing, the jelly luminescent in my breast. It's Medusa stalks, a wave of supplication, umbrella pulse of dreams. Uh, this one's called Iceland. Here come the boats from Denmark. Here come the boats from Norway from the endless stretch of nothing to the island jaunt of nothing. Cliffs a million campsite fires, farms few and far between as under kitchen light, misty blue geothermal water fills with sulfur. Sheer velocity against my face, no matter where I turn my little horse against the wind, there goes our boat to Ireland. From endless solstice light to magma chambers spilled and cold, the wind eats everything. We shelter by the hill. And I only have one more. It's called um, Lace Curtain You Drape Over Every Mirror. Keep that smile barbed, the wire the horse leans against. Birds crack seeds on the other side of your glass door. The body, blind, curves its hedge down paths through time's narrow microscope. A clump of cells, narrow threader juking the ground, reverberates. They say it's gone. It's gone. Everyone's hands shifting you gently. No knowing, not knowing. You know that now. Their silent nods. Stone cutter precision, your plea for the tool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. Our next reader is Daisy Novoa Vasquez, a Latin writer passionate about intercultural understanding, education, and the arts. Welcome, Daisy. Gracias, Philip. Thank you. So I read in Spanish always, and I write always in Spanish. <laughs> but my dear friend Alan Smith helped me translate some of my poems that I will be sharing with you. The first one will be the only one that I will read both in Spanish and then in English, and the rest will be in English. Uh, Hoy extraño Chile. Hoy extraño Chile, la longitud enorme de sus tierras y la ternura con que el viento mece sus copihues a lo largo de las cordilleras. Hoy extraño el sur del mundo y sus noches que son magia, cielos salpicados de estrellas, centinelas del alba. Hoy mi corazón anhela las frambuesas que recolecté de niña. No hay en el mundo ningún otro lugar con frambuesas tan divinas. Hoy mis latidos claman sus dadivosas mareas y sus nevados y sus valles y su gente buena. Hoy extraño Chile más que cualquier otro día, sus campos con toldos de parra, donde la vid es esmeralda y amatista. Oh, tierra de poetas, mañana quizá te abrace. Quiero recorrerte, 
desde Arica hasta Magallanes. So that poem is uh, for Chile and you know now we cannot travel. It's my longing call to, to my country and the country of my parents. Um, today I miss Chile. Today I miss Chile, the enormous length of its lands and the tenderness in which the wind rocks its bell flowers along the mountain ranges. Today I miss the south of the world and its magic, magic nights, soul and peppered skies, sentinels of dawn. Today my heart longs for its raspberries, those I collected as a child. There are none like them in the world, no other place with raspberries so divine. Today my heartbeats cry out for its bountiful tides and its snowy mountains and its valleys and its good people. Today I miss Chile more than any other day. It's filled with vine canopies where the grape is emerald and amethyst. O oh, land of poets, tomorrow maybe I'll hold you tight. I want to travel your length from Arica to Magallanes. The next uh, poems are from my book, Flor Inocencia. The book is only in Spanish, hopefully soon bilingual. Uh, look at our hands. You've now awakened and your corn hands are already exhausted. Dawn's blue prelude runs through. Your skin is tanned and you have not even cried yet. Sweat will come with work. Undeniable the suffering, the helplessness, the gap in the belly, bigger and bigger. It's not right for you to think you have failed them all. If you break your back working and those on top last for money, at least you know your children eat well-earned bread. You've awakened already and this world of injustice goes on turning. I ask you, please look at our hands. An official version of my shadows. I walk the city, dark tunnels suck me in. I see thousands of molecules flee my skin and with my speed, I leave my soul behind. My eyes lose themselves in movements of melting walls. Time's unrecognizable vibration runs through my body. On high tension wires, a bird sings to my veins, my toesies. I have stopped being the same so as to become an unofficial version of my shadows. The next one is called Going Back to the Island. Going back to the island. I can bring back the island, bring it to my memory. Underwater roots grow like hands covering emerald rings. I remember the turquoise and delicate crepe paper of the waters, the little multicolored fish longing to swim to mild shores, mangroves making their way between the waves, in the green boards like cotton tulips, seagulls and herons alight. I want to return to the island where people make love on its beaches, not on the warm and pleasant sand, but rather in the cadence of the ardent tide where tulips fly, stretching and freeing their wings, cutting the earth's heat with tender geometries and strange beads. And the last one, cataclysm. It's useless to think that one can defeat time. There are gods who wake up with a hangover and that day earth shakes. Then beads of spark pierce the nightingale in your breast. Tides meet to air and kind angels take our death away. Thank you.
Wonderful day, sir. Thank you. Our next reader should be Willie Ramirez, but I do not see you, Willie. Are you here? Could you speak up if you're here? I guess Willie is not with us. Um, okay, so that's that's a pity. Um, but we will go next to the, the next reader. Pedro, are you ready? I hope you're ready. Yes. So Pedro Puiteda is a self-described hesitant mathematician and decisive poet. He writes in and translates into Spanish and English. He is currently translating my poetry. I could not say it any more ecstatically. Uh, for which bless him and welcome, Pedro. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I will uh, read uh, a couple of stoic sonnets and then I'll move into free verse, talk about um, particle wave duality. As you know, I'm a mathematician, so I have to sneak that in into my poetry and then I'll have maybe one more point. Uh, so this one is uh, self-portrait as a dog out walking. Unbelievable hand that gives my soul this gentle bit of slack during our stroll. Will you release me, grab the ball and throw it? I'd splash about and fetch it like a poet. Beloved hand that takes me to the hill to shed my vanity and train my well. Take pity and allow that other mutt to come to me this once and smell my butt. Then take me to your nightly game of chess. I promise to stay still and nibble less and wake up when you're ready to head home and walk right next to you and let you roam. Even if hounds smell death and bark, the reaper, I'll lick you lovingly, my life, my keeper. And um, the next stoic sonnet is called Raking. I step more lightly when October leaves pile up like scattered drafts of some design an aging hand is hurrying to render. My path is strewn with doubts the spirit cleaves and as I walk along it, these combine to form a truth of variegated splendor. When I turned 17, my father gave me the letters to Lucilius. I remember his slender fingers leafing through creased pages. Surely he knew no sleight of hand could save me from aching on this byway to December where everything about me breaks or ages. This isn't done, I smile and turn around, my, my feet still two good inches off the ground. Um, and now for a slight change of pace, this is a, a, a poem in free verse called At the Harbor. And again, this is about quantum mechanics, but hopefully the physics is very hidden under the rug. Um, At the Harbor. I'm still not sure it's you out there waving in my direction. The dock is full of people waiting. Two women next to me talk about a far off revolution, the first of many to come, one says, and go, the other says, and while the first of them gestures, the other shakes her head. A child complains to his mother about the sudden smell of fish, but he's soon transfixed by a seagull flapping its wings as it lands nearby. A man raises an eyebrow and from the way his body shifts, I gather he's unhappy about the loud music booming through the earphones of a young man nodding along in solemn synchrony with the radio. I hear an improbable word, stardust. I flow back to the time you said, it's not true. We're not made of stardust, honey. It simply comes and goes like we do. How I came the closest to grasping what you meant when Suddenly, our kiss vanished. We're waves, you said. Waves. And, and to close, um, I will read a, a, a villanelle that um, 
is is about itself. It's a self-referential poem, and it's uh, I like to think of it as an infinitely or a recursively narcissistic poem because it talks about the writing of it, but somehow the reading of it uh, moves me because it describes what I experienced writing it so accurately. Um, so it is called, um, I feel the memory of writing you. I feel the memory of writing you beginning to carve out its riverbed deep in the shadow of my passing through. How after scanning you beneath, I flew a little lower, how I turned my head. I feel the memory of riding you, my labyrinthine road. I had no clue how to begin or end before I read deep in the shadow of my passing through the story I demanded to be true. In each one of the knots along the thread, I feel the memory of riding you. The moment when I felt your pulse, I knew. And as you slowly found your form, I shed deep in the shadow of my passing through, a love song to the love song that you drew with words I'd say to words I hadn't said. I feel the memory of writing you deep in the shadow of my passing through. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. That was very vivid and also very symmetrical. Uh, beautiful. Um, so let's see. Um, Alan Smith Soto is our next reader, and he writes in Spanish and English. He was born in Costa Rica, and he lives lives in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts. Alan, great to see you. This is, I guess, this, like the third time that I, I, that we meet in this. Life. The previous one was at your place and was great. Thanks for that. Welcome. Alan, have we lost Alan? Oh, that would, he was here. I Hello. He's he's placing the mic. There he is. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. okay. All right. Philip, I, I was saying it's wonderful to see you and Kathy again, and we will meet in person soon. I trust. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. The first poem is a haiku. I went to the pond, a leaf fell in the water next to the old cloud. King James Bible, the sound of brambled air, torn earth and bread, silence of linen, the easy stink of wool where incense was, at one remove the gist of it. And now just to live dangerously, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna read a poem that I could not resist but writing as we spoke. And I took a line from one of the poets and reversed it. So this is sort of a game. I wonder if you'll find it. Here it goes. It starts with an epigraph, Luke 24, one. Bringing the spices which they had prepared. She ran ahead, both hands grasping the jar filled with scented oil making her clumsy as she neared the place where stone was no longer catching on to him. <clears throat> In medias res, don't know the first word of love, not the last, just middling stuff, a shoulder blade, a dear hello, a no, a yes. Uh, 
Ars Poetica. Late afternoon, I'm sitting in my garden, smoking my cheroot, and I find myself blowing smoke rings, actually the form the tongue takes to envelop it in flavor causes the rings, the shape of sense suspended in the shift. A reading from Mark. Only a young man followed him wrapped in linen and when the guards laid hands on him, he ran away naked and left the cloth in their clasp. Days later, Mary Magdalene saw him sitting in the cave to the right in his white garment. And he said, he's gone. May moon. I am afraid of losing everything. And look out the window above the half leaved branches at a huge disc. My moon shadow moves across the room. Everything is not mine to lose. Compass. I write for you when I face north, being lost, or east, as if I had to wait, or south to join the feast, or west to throw a shadow. For you, I wrote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ruth Lebson. She's a poet in residence at the New England Conservatory, and her new and collected poems is forthcoming. Thank you, Philip, Ruth, for bringing. Welcome, Ruth. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing us together. Uh, we need these readings now. Good to see everyone. So uh, I'm going to read a prose poem. It's not my usual style and it's long. So uh, Philip agreed to let me read it earlier today, but I decided in lieu of boring you, I would just cut it in half. So I've just done that and we'll see if it coheres, but it's the poem I feel involved with now. <clears throat> the Yellow Tulip for Garrett Lansing. When Garrett died, the image of a yellow tulip popped into my mind and childish as it seemed, I couldn't shake it. Then I saw a golden flower in an illustration, symbol of the philosopher's stone. The Jains of Rajasthan, India devote themselves to feeding flocks of demoiselle cranes who migrate at 23,000 feet over the Himalayas. The first verse of the Ramayana curses the hunter who killed the male of a pair. Because all verse was received, was considered received until then, this passage is taken to be the oldest composed poetry in the world. People who ventured far from home or undertaken difficult journeys are often compared to these delicate cranes. Within decades, a quarter of the earth's population will be forced to migrate. Homer, whoever they were, 
made it to India, as did Plato and, Democr and Democritus. It could be that they learned about atoms there, those irreducible bits of matter, the speculation really a quest for immortality, a method of reconstituting the dead body. Is it lonely to remain anonymous or a relief, like becoming ordinary? What might it mean to know in silence? I've wanted to know you, what it must be like to love in silence, without desire to articulate your desire, living in color in the meadows and low mountains. A certain number of volunteers who film secretly inside factory farms commit suicide, especially after their first exposure. The cruelty is so extreme. <clears throat> Something got hotter and infinitely more dense until its interior turned to lead then exploded, creating everything. We, the constellations, the triumphant stars, the half moon. The Greeks were well aware they were newcomers to their region of the world. Persia, Mesopotamia, and Egypt having existed for centuries. In Egypt, very little changed through time as Isis protected the meaning of things. Whereas in Greece, new words were constantly invented and argument was everything. The first poem I memorized is Longfellow's. The world is so full of a number of things, I'm sure we should all be as happy as kings. Are kings happy? And who's this speaker so sure? Which things is the world so full of anyway these days? Voltaire added bits of chocolate already a luxury to his coffee. He was a coffee fanatic. He once wrote that hopeful was his favorite state of mind in human beings. So he wasn't kidding when he said the best of all possible worlds in a way, but we haven't tended our gardens. On the BBC in Yemen, a young woman begs the doctor, don't tell us about the virus, please. We have enough horror already. Patulous spreading out from the center as the branches from the tree. She says sometimes she imagines she's a tree planted firmly in the ground. That would bother me. A fundamental difference between plants and animals is that animals move around. Putting people in solitary confinement has to do with the destruction of the earth. When a Tibetan master knows he's going to die, he retires to his mountain hut. A few weeks later, the others come. This has happened thousands of times that followers enter the hut only to find that there's no skeleton there just hair and nails and floating around the room, rainbows. Once his car swayed on a bridge in a storm. Since then he's avoided bridges. Me, he said, imagine me being afraid of something. The alchemical process won't work when attempted at the wrong time. He insists that aliens have lived on earth for thousands of years. When I say that's ridiculous, he says, I don't have an open mind. Anything can happen. No, it can't, I say. Do you think that lamp could turn into a peacock? Maybe, he says, how can you be sure that it can't? Supposedly, Buddha said, never meditate on karma. It's so complex, it can destroy your mind. Cause and effect is a Western concept. There's actually no such thing. It's like synchronicity. It happens, but that doesn't mean we know anything about it or anything about alchemy. The unconscious rules alchemy. The individual's dreams remain powerful. Religions promote the collective dreams. When people delve into the unconscious and surface, they make jokes and treat other people like idiots. It's too much to take all at once. This process must take place over and over. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ruth. 
Our next reader is John Mulroney, a poet, musician, and filmmaker from Boston, who teaches at Bridgewater State University. Welcome, John. Oh, thank you so much, Philip. Um, and uh, wonderful to hear everybody. Uh, peacocks. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. I was, I was in the crowd that wanted to uh, have that go on. Um, thanks to Philip. Thanks to our um, Zoom Bomber security squad. And uh, a Massachusetts poem, the working title of which is Sleeping Through Satori Under Parker's Statue. In the confessional, the, slat, the slats broke shafts of light coming through, you hoped from above. Disembodied heads floated in the patchwork darkness and light that descended to an even darker floor. Bless me, bless you. Did I sin? No, I sneezed. A voice says to seek light from within. Tonight, no blackout. The sins of one dream streak across the common and shine upon the hill, flashes of blue like angry phosphorus in the Fort Point Channel. Graffiti girds the swamp angel's backsides and the windows on Boylston shatter like tempest waves raging in the tide. In the confessional, catharsis was leather bound and cushioned. The secrets revealed, the pains and pangs of quiet desperation were presumed to calm. In the confessional confessed that all the morning doves gather on the roof of the house next door and are unaffected by the helicopters. That the guidebooks sustained you more than books on aesthetics and train timetables more than both. Stephen Jonas lived at 91 Revere Street. Being of unsure mind and shaky morals, he betook himself to be first a butterfly, then something approaching a hot dog. But in your family, it was all about the pantomime, betaking yourselves as ones who might attack the Lords of the Loom and the Lash with equal vigor. Fred Burke, providing land that had been Camp Miggs for the 54th reenactors to drill on. In the confessional, confess you coveted Sakimuni and Vanzetti's Bamiyan stair and cop their faces on the orange line for the ride to Skippy White's where you could disappear, be one with your brothers who wished to be among the invisible. In the confessional, confess that you let a perfectly good play of frogs go to waste and that Theodore Parker's statue spoke to you first in dreams and then the voice in the back of your head you heard on Center Street and that you knew then you should never tell and that you knew it was a sin to not remember what he told you the blank space into which you woke suddenly, the warm rush of the supernatural somehow becoming home in you. Is that me or is that you? This poem is talking to the city. The city where Sako and Varakana take the hungry children to Joe and Nemo's for a supreme dog. The city where Sarah Parker Raymond was tossed out of the old Howard halfway through Don Pasquale before old Scully Square got old. The city where there is an East Boston, but only the desperate go there. The city where I am always descended from collaborators and know I can keep that sometimes hidden and sometimes held to my breast like a locket of grief rubbed with thumb and forefinger for all to see. Dublin-born Augustus St. Godin makes the front page again when Boston officials plead with protesters to respect our city. A city that doesn't see its statues walk the streets unmoored from pedestals, but they do. A city that does not see itself, that does not see we are the measure, and as the measure, we are the models. We cannot take the measure of what we cannot conceive. We cannot honor the memory of what we haven't done, and we cannot measure, and what we cannot measure can only find its way into flash bomb, stun grenade, a long range acoustic device that crams a song we cannot hear into our throats. At the mouth of the public garden, three men sprawled in filth, theirs, ours, the social contract, a topographical map of hardships now thrown far away, beyond their eyes, shut to all but opiate oblivion. They lie like O'Sullivan's harvest of death, their sleeping bags and shopping carts, the bedrolls and ammo wagons that littered battlefields from Gettysburg to Fort Wagner. They don't recall last night, the regiments that marched to see if Charles Eliot lied when he wrote, undying proof is what the soldier's sacrifice provides. And if pride, courage, devotion make lives that matter, in the confessional, the shafts of light, like the moon seen from underwater, the priest's submerged baritone offers absolution and an alibi, one substance transformed to another in the burning and the unburning, in the burning and the unburning. The Ashtavahista promised revelation, but Father Rosenthal says, you are honor bound not to reveal. What cannot be removed, but will abide forever. I would never tell what Parker said. Tell him you are a plagiarist. I tell him I am a plagiarist. He says, you didn't just say that. Tell them there's a pit with a nest of white creatures. I don't care if this poem gets graffitied. Write all of this all over this poem. Replace each word with each word. I'm ready for this world and so can welcome a valley full of empty mouths of death. And please light this poem on fire and throw it in the cavern of sorrows beneath Bunken Hill, wherein we stash our squash colored buses. 
where Louise Day Hicks's roar still reaches the cable stays of the Zakin Bridge. Light this poem on fire and let it light the lost half mile. Light this poem and rub its ashes into your mouth. The taste of it, a trace of metal, of blood and sorrow of the tongue that's tied and it's tied when and when is the tongue that tells you all you know. Thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, let's see, I lost the list. No. Uh, Zach Bose runs New England Review of Books and Pen and Anvil Press. Welcome, Zach. You have the floor. Uh, thanks very much. I, I'll start with some poems that I've written since lockdown. Uh, March 28th, the Jubilee. My mother called me 20 years ago yesterday, though in those days we never really talked by phone or talked. And those years ago today, I traveled down by train to the funeral, but arrived too late to see my father's body before it had been reduced into a uniform ash and funneled into an urn. I read from gospel, wearing a black jacket and a brown belt. I was not, am not, much one for prayer, but sitting there among some grief, I thought about intercessory help. Saint somewhere, Saint anywhere, Saint something, Saint nothing. What can be said about what cannot be said? My father was dead, who for me and for years and years had not been much more than the remembered flaccid scent of tobacco in his hair, in my hair. This is April at home in the body. Cachexia, pleurisy, normlessness, grip, marasmo, hemorrhoids, dysplastic hip, loneliness, anomie, depressive mood, forgetting to sleep, unhealthy food, working from home, ain't entirely good, and a poem from May, titled May. Oh look, it's maple red blossom season, roadsides wet with possum carcass season, season of cardinals guarding their nests, and robin worm puller smearing his chest. This is a stoic sonnet, I suppose, uh, titled Kenosis, and it uh, was written in Groton Town Forest out here in Central Mass. I saw a dead hemlock, cone bedizened, suddenly expand, when small birds hidden in the mesh of needled branches all launched together from their perches. Like fragments of explosion, they vectored out and filled the air before collapsing once again to mesh their volume with that of the tree. They stayed in motion, a particle sphere opening and closing around the dry spindle of the gray trunk a toy model of Pascal's God, whose center can be found everywhere at once and whose circumference does not intersect the visible world, who renounced selfhood for murmuration. This is equinox in the language of birds. What tells that it is time to praise the transitory? White frost ferns on the flesh this morning and choruses of mobbing crows crying hunger, hunger, from stations in the empty oaks. The wind rolls handfuls of twig and acorn and desiccated leaf across the browning grass, seeking fortune in the pattern. Wild geese, fearing the greater infortune, rise and wheel away. Pullulating starlings shimmer in their dances of protection. The constant season urges flight in changing angles of the light and asks us to forget the burial of redemption and regret, the migration of song from north to south, the sparrows clinging to barren vines, the coiled snake in the field stone wall frozen, an unmigrating owl crowning the winter pine. Alone among our unread books, we watch the turning of the year for something lost or almost here, the calendar's false symmetries. And I'll end with another stoic sonnet, uh, mud daubers. Outside the chapel window, wasps labor on the stone lintel, building wombs. Lance tip jaws champ soil into mortar, the brisset shape and smooth. 
Each pipe of clay conceals a chain of sealed chambers. Inside each cell is laid a meal of paralyzed spider. And one white egg, waiting to burst open, black-bodied, blue-winged, newly made, brutal. Perhaps I, too, could transform my life, turn saintly, become the sort of man who leaves ripe fruit on the lintel for the masons, for them who, to show thanks, might chew away my raw vêtement and bring dust and spit to beatify and reflesh my bones. Thanks very much, Philip. Thank you, Zach. Tom Graves lives by the sea in Salem, Massachusetts, and is the editor of Scariot. Welcome, Tom. Can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, everyone. Um, let me try and share my screen. Let's see if this works. Can you guys see this? OK. Uh, the poetry. There is an industry for every need, an efficiency for every type of greed. I always thought the businessman was full of vice, but he's just like me. He's smart. He's nice. The lonely guy who dreamed on the fjord is the novelist who wrote The Thrill Who Roared. The thrill is a man of appetites like me. The thrill's girlfriend dies of an accident on page 133. It could have happened on page 304. I really don't care that much anymore. I could make a killing on box wine or olive oil. Where do I sign? You've got to be presentable. You've got to care and be nice. No, it's not me. It's the poetry that's the vice. Okay, let's see if I jump to another. Can you see the new one? You see the new poem? Okay. This is called, it's Psychology 101. It's Psychology 101. Memory is made of bone. Nothing is forgotten. Whatever you did, whatever happened to you, this is precisely what you are going to do. An ancient Greek play sang of fate impossible to avoid. This is the whole of the unconscious of Freud. You are proud of your ability to forgive, aren't you? It doesn't matter. No one can help what they do. Why do you think psychology is something new or needs to be studied? It is what you are. It is you. The trouble is when you study it, you pretend you can avoid your fate waiting for you in the end. Don't worry about anything. Did I say fate? There's no free will, whether you rest or hate. Um, here's one I wrote about uh, uh, Ashbery after he died and um, anyone who's a poet will know the references here if you don't know uh, Andrew Marvel was an old poet who knew Milton and I guess he defended he defended Milton when they were going to kill him um, and Ashbery is a contemporary poet who I, I make a reference to the fact that he was, his poetry is ambiguous. And Andrew Marvel was more of a devoted kind of poet. Um, I see three rabbits softly bound through a soundless garden without a sound. The hunting owl dividing the air flies soundlessly with soundless care. The hunter steps in the soundless mind. Speech and warning and singing are kind. 
See the sheep who cannot say why it's especially quiet today. Mortality with loud breath chants this poem of airless death. Ashbury's dead and no one knows where our pagan poet goes. Andrew Marvel, whom he quoted, would say, but none today is this devoted to claim heaven as the place we go from language and its place below. He has no poetry anymore, word that makes the whole world poor. So Ashbury wanders with a smirk in the shades of his ambiguous work. And here's a poem that I wrote this morning, only the old is true. And that line popped into my head and I just had to write a poem. Uh, the title wrote the poem for me. Only the old is true. Of course you want it, the exciting and new, and you will have it, but only the old is true. She had to get out of prison and she was counting on you. She came to you with a smile, but only the old is true. Stay inside your prison, it's good. Good prisons are few. For a moment you were exciting, but only the old is true. I heard the prophet say, not every debt is due. This one is not, yes, this one is not. Only the old is true. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, Tom. I wonder, is Gloria Mindek with us? Yes, I am. Oh, great, great. I, for some reason, I couldn't see you. Uh, uh, like, I was trying to look at, look through the, uh, through all the participants. Uh, so, um, Gloria Mindek is editor of, is this how you say Cervena Barva? Yes. Okay, Cervena Barva Press. And her sixth book, Ash, is forthcoming. Welcome, Gloria. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's an honor to read with everybody. So the first poem is called, What If God Is Strict? I am looking for the right flesh with no bleeding, my voice free, hanging from the crucifix, passion from these lips, igniting sins to clot my mouth. Crucifixes break every day, are shoved into a drawer, collect dust in a thrift shop. Sometimes Jesus becomes so dusty that cleaning him is a problem. The, du the dust too thick to let him resurrect. When he does, he sneezes. Maybe Jesus will develop an allergy, a miracle of life. This next poem is called Sky. The dark sky attacked my heart with the only thing it knows, lightning. Such a pounding in my chest, despite being half burnt, my valves still beating. When the wind blew into my face, I could not breathe, my gasping loud. Finally, when the rain hit, I was drowning in the drops, saturated. There was little hope for me. When the sun returned, I was gone. The air was crisp, the sky clear. Like when someone dies, the emptiness is always there. And the last one I'll read is called Barely. Pulled from the fire, unconscious. Skin, blackened, filleted, sliding off skin. You burnt me. Barely alive, thinking, and thinking of how it was between us, laughing at the things that only we got. What happened that your flame became destructive? Over and over, flesh burned. You could never catch up with yourself even when hosed with water, you drowned. 
No, I will not throw you a life preserver. Thank you. Thank you. So, so wonderful to hear everyone. Uh, so, and we, we're by and by, we're uh, nearing the end of the reading. There are only three more readers to go. Our next reader is Sam Ranowski, who is roughly human shaped to within a few standard deviations of the mean and writes poems. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Philip, for having us all here and for putting this together. Um, the first poem that I'm going to read today uh, is a response to two Japanese texts. Uh, the first is In Praise of Shadows, which is an aesthetic essay uh, by Junichiro Tanizaki. Um, and the second is uh, a short satirical vignette called uh, The Beef Eater by Kanagaki Robun. So this poem is called The Beef Eaters. In sin the ocean bore us, gunboats throbbing with anticipation, open shoulders of the waves cradling a head of steam. Edo was only as we expected it, desperate for pocket watches, buttons, the exotic ornaments we pinned to coat fronts, everything that made us decent. Stripped of these, our finest qualities were sorted into piles. Beef cows, wool coats, Croatian neckties, unimaginative tangles in the lifeless sun. The paper lanterns that they used were hardly fit to light such splendor, so we strung up gas lamps to reveal our glory. Dying coals we laid to rest in boiler rooms were all we left to hold some sooty corner of a dark to hide our nakedness. Untouched like certain mirrors that they hid from us in unlit shrines, we found ourselves with nothing to reflect from all our burnished surfaces. But I've inscribed inside of oyster shells the rest, accounts of all that lights could fall on and of things I knew that couldn't be repeated. Here I left a record of that cargo and the flash of teeth from in a recess of such a dark that one could only say was fitting to its purpose or of lacquerware that I had seen and liked, I wrote perhaps a line or so, inserted them in mantle folds, then shut them up like briny jewels that only certain eyes might look upon. These and motions of a hand inside the darkness of a sleeve are only half invented memories for those of us who chose to speak of them. In sin, the ocean bore us, dying pockets and the wind falling like a light so weak it only darkens shadows on the flawless surfaces we carried unimaginative angles cut from lifeless sun. Um, the next poem I'm going to read uh, is called uh, At the Collapse of Notre Dame. And uh, the poem begins with a uh, quote by Bertrand Barrère, who was uh, a party member of uh, Robespierre's uh, during the French Revolution and famously began the uh, killing known as the terror with the uh, statement, let us make terror the order of the day. So at the collapse of Notre Dame, let terror be the order of the day for those of us who took no photographs and plastered over tympana. Let devils shit from capitals and cornices and lost souls wail. I have waited for what feels like centuries for glass to pit and blanch with rain, the ancient reds and blues the painted face of Jesus Christ indifferent to be rid of them. I often fear that there will be no day of reckoning, no scorching end for those of us who worshiped reason. The sun has stripped the pigment from these stones and I have prayed to feel the mercy of its fire. Let terror be the order of the day to all who cry for permanence and never found the burning eyes of saints in lights that fall from torches into pools of gasoline. It is not happiness to see the end of days, but happiness to see the end. And we have seen the end and marched with chisels over cobblestones and shrieked, let terror comfort me for I have waited centuries and fear there is no day of reckoning apart from this. And the final poem that I'm going to read is called uh, Taxin, which uh, I guess is a poem about what happens when uh, the words you're using change while you're trying to use them. Um, Taxon. In 300 years when basically not much has changed, but we can track the word it's differently and all the sea anemones have raised their heads and split their necks to swim away as jellyfish. What will we ever, uh, what will we ever say to all the uncountable, let's say twenties of disputed subspecies we had left unnamed for later? 
say that we have not ignored their sacrifice of anonymity, but we're waiting for such concrete evidence as may be found by then to classify in base pairs changes that escape translation over centuries, that we must let such loving use of nomenclature repartition arguments, ease the joints of language, carry forth some barely understood genetic richness as might benefit posterity. Say to let the nerves meander through our skeletons, drop the silent spaces from our words and fall away without an antecedent into observation. We'll take the pulse of newer languages as evidence of thoughts we can't express, but must have grasped by gentle computation. The rest we only speculate. The use of words and sentences transcribed from thoughts, the names for differences we only half perceive, and all the unfelt subtleties of shifting taxa. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, our penultimate reader is Blake Campbell. He grew up in a Pennsylvania farmhouse and now lives in Salem, Massachusetts. Most welcome, Blake. The floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Philip, and um, thank you very much to everybody who agreed to be part of this event. Um, I've just been astonished at the high quality and, and the variety of the work that we've seen today. Um, I'm going to start with a poem from uh, my new chapbook called Across the Creek, which um, Zach was kind enough to post um, a link to in the chat, um, available from Penn and Anvil Press, um, and the poem is called Crane Beach. On the beach, the sandy wind falls and rises in the thinned ranks of grass that crown the dunes, where the piping plover croons. And its efforts in exact fashioning a ventifact from this cloudy shard of quartz, billowing our shirts and shorts as it blows in from the sea, mime your putting up with me and my putting up with you. Though the wind may chill us through, edges soften in its surge where the sea and sand converge, and the sand's corrosive sting leaves behind a polished thing. Um, and the next poem I'm going to do is a little bit more recent. This one is called Triops. Um, these are a kind of crustacean. They're kind of like sea monkeys on steroids. They're very old. They're prehistoric. Um, you, you get their dried out eggs and you add water to them and they hatch out and they grow very quickly. Um, and this is a poem about their life cycle. Triops. Pure potential, the triops waited in their desiccated eggs for spring rain. But I woke them in winter with bottled water. Soon their Tupperware nursery teemed with pink larvae, dancing like dust motes under a desk lamp. Each day they doubled in size, dwindled in number, hungry. Those who hatched late fell prey to their siblings. Now the grown victors flaunt their success. They sprint upside down just under the surface, red legs bristling beneath each carapace, tails forked and saurian. Set in their heads like toadstones, their third eyes apprehend only shadows, attain no enlightenment. Kicking up sediment, they set adrift shed exoskeletons. Flimsy, non-degradable, discarded selves that litter the gravel. They conceive without sex, excavate nests for red eggs, leave them to their temporary death. In weeks, the mothers weaken. Outside, the old, impatient sun would be enough to do them in. I can wait. In here, the rainy season ends when I decide. Um, and the last poem I'm going to read is called Drake's Island. It's another um, seaside poem uh, about a neighborhood in Wells, Maine, where I, I used to spend quite a bit of time. Um, and there's a lot in here about the Maine wildlife that I hope is pretty self-explanatory. Drake's Island. The unexpected sunshine, harsh against the foliage of the breaks, 
the sea breeze tempers as it makes the aspens whisper from the marsh. The sea speaks too with weathered lips, inviting plovers, lovers here, balloons that plunge and reappear and pairs of eiders in eclipse. The cormorants, the fishermen, the Dunlin spooked when kayaks pass, the harrier that leaves the grass with empty claws to try again. While flocks of gulls advance and flee and bicker through the breakers noise and through the splashing of the boys who throw themselves against the sea. I cannot count myself as one, but any envy ebbs and dulls. I walk the jetty where the gulls have dashed their catches on the stone and turning from the bather's fray, from jagged rock and shattered shell, I watch a seal break from a swell and take a peek and swim away and sink again without concern to meet the ocean's hard embrace as I must leave this sacred place that does not ask me to return. Thank you everybody for your time today. Oh, thank you, Blake. And isn't it quite a wonderful tapestry of poetics and visions that this thing has worked out to? Zach and I were just chatting back channel about what a nice format this uh, seems to be. Uh, you know, five minutes is a good kind of installment, a good injection of a poet. And now it's my turn. And with the following short poems, we will conclude this. Facts of life, big fiefdoms of leaves, beehives of griefs, companies of thieves, conglomerates of these, a worldwide disease are anywhere you breathe. If you haven't yet thought that you're sold and bought, you haven't thought aught. The policy is signed. Now it can only bind whether or not you mind. The righteous among us. You see, it is no longer possible to discuss political issues as the philosophical problems that they are. The world is no longer philosophical. In the postmodern world, an opponent's position is always reducible to evil without a remainder. There's always, always someone righteous out there to whom your views, products of your own thinking, are completely reducible to malice, posturing, bigotry, and cowardice. To them, you always think what they think you think, simply because you're too evil, too bigoted, phony, and afraid to think and speak correctly, to espouse the proper values, values that require no justification, values that no amount of information can dislodge and to think and speak like the righteous, like the righteous among us. They know who they are. I only write poems. I'm working on a book of fiction. Oh yeah, in what genre? It's a memoir. I'm a painter. Oh yeah, what's your medium? Collage. My essays are philosophical meditations Oh yeah, what are they about? My body. I'm a musician. Oh yeah, what kind of musician? A DJ. And you are? Oh yeah, a poet. So you write fiction too? No, only poems. Oh yeah, and how do you make a living? I don't. And lastly, my career. My career lay in wait for me in the square, or was it the other way around? Either way, we somehow managed to miss each other, never made acquaintance. Sometimes I wonder how my career is advancing out there, all alone by itself. And on this note of indomitable optimism, we conclude this reading. Thank you all so much for attending. This was great, wasn't it? Thank you. So I hope this will get saved and uh, will end up eventually on Facebook and on YouTube for for all takers. Take care, guys. Asiba. I have to go. So I, thank I, you, Philip. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Paka. Ciao. Peace. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, Ruth.
I didn't recognize you, Ed. Hi, Ruth. How are you? Who's that? It's David Blair. I got to undo my vid start video. Hey. Oh, hey. How you doing? Good. You know, my student from 1986 just said hi, Ruth, and got off. I didn't recognize him. He was on the whole time. Oh, that's cool. Isn't that something? Yeah. 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 Hey, I like the way all of your all of your pictures are leaning forward as if to come on to you. Yeah, it's like a, you know, it's because that's the, the side of the house. It's like the- I know, the, 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 I know, but it just has an interesting effect. Like they're all gonna go into your brain. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they do. They, they, they have that tendency, yeah. Good combo, huh? Mm -hmm. Today, yeah. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> 